Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So welcome to the beginning of this uh, new series that I wanted to start doing. I wanted to uh, just go with you guys together through a kind of Bible study sessions. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna take a look at Paul letters in the New Testament and we're gonna just read the each chapter and we'll try to do one episode for each chapter and trying to analyze, you know, the main uh, theological points that uh, the uh, that the Bible, you know, is making here, and trying to understand a bit more and uh, going deeper, you know, into the Word of God and trying to increase in our knowledge and wisdom, and in trying to understand well what the what the Bible is saying, right? Um, and uh, now I have here this uh, um, website that's super super cool. And I'm going to follow the New American Trans Standard Bible translation because it's one of the most accurate ones. And I also recommend you to try to go into this uh, version right here that is called uh, Interlinear Bible, in which you have pretty much the original text in Greek um, with all the you know commas, all the grammar. Uh, and then you have downwards the translation, like word by word, or sometimes, you know, concept because uh, the Greek words sometimes have more um, a meaning, you know, if you just translate them in English. And uh, this uh, translation, of course, is uh, follows the uh, Greek grammar and positioning. So sometimes can be uh, not as smooth to understand, maybe just to read down. But this is actually super, super good because uh, each word you can see that you can click on each word and you can go into the uh, to the overall meaning of the word, different places when you find this word. Uh, and so it's uh, it's super super useful. So I really recommend you, like, if you wanna go deeper into your um, Bible studies and you're gonna go deeper into you know what the Word of God is saying, that definitely this is a very good uh, choice and a very good thing to do. Uh, now, just for practical reasons, I will uh, just read from the uh, as I said before from this uh, uh, New American Standard Bible uh, translation. And uh, yeah, we're gonna read all the chapter one first, uh, and then we're gonna try to focus a bit more on uh, some key points or some important points, you know, that uh, I think can be worth uh, mentioning and discussing. So let's just read first uh, Romans one. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles in behalf of his name, among whom you also are the call of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the first like full stop. So you can see all this first uh, introduction into his uh, letter. Uh, then he continues and uh, Paul says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how as unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, requesting if perhaps now, at last by the will of God, I will succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may, be, I may obtain some fruit among you just also just as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to the uncultured, both to the wise and to the foolish. So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, by the righteous one will live by faith. And uh, this is like, uh, to this translation, this is the first, like the, the end of this first uh, uh, part, if we can call it like that. That in this case, they are, they have put this mini uh, title that says the gospel exalted. And it's also the introduction, you know, Paul just expressing his desire to come to this church and be with them. Um, and, uh, and then here there is the second part of the first chapter that the mini title is unbelief and, and its consequences. And, uh, and then it continues here from verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile or futile, I don't know how to say it, uh, in their reasonings, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them up to vile impurity in the lusts of their hearts, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason... God uh, gave them over to degrading passions, for the women exchange natural relations for that which is contrary to nature, and likewise the men, too, abandoned natural relations with women and burned in the desire toward one another, males with males, committing shameful acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit, to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind, to do those things that are not proper, people having been filled with all our righteousness, weakness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but, they, but also approve of those who practice them. And that's, the, that's verse 32, and that's the end of chapter uh, 1. So... Um, so that's the, that's the uh, Bible, you know, that's the word, uh, what it says. And this translation, if you go into the interlinear one, you can see that it's very, very accurate. And you also have all these little dots here, these references. And in the bottom, you have actually the literal uh, meaning from the Greek, right? So you can see here, rather than, for example, uh, using seed, they place the word descendant because it means, you know, descend of seed. Um, and you can see here, all the small changes sometimes or the different meanings that could that that Greek word could mean is being listed here. So it's very, very um uh it's very open, you know, and they just give you literally their literal meaning or a possible alternative uh translation to the word. So now based on this first chapter, you see we have uh, two main parts. So you have the introduction part. And then we have this um, kind of apologetical part uh, and uh, the consequences of 
uh, no, not following God and not um, uh, worshiping him, you know, not following and obeying him. And I have placed here, like I have this very small word, <laughs> a text, where I've just uh, uh, listed down the kind of the most, or like for my, in my opinion, right, the most important points that I could understand and I could uh, get from reading this first chapter. And uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, focus on the fact that Paul, right at the beginning, is calling Jesus Christ. And now this word, uh, Christ, comes from the Greek here, Christo. And if you click here, this is going to give you to the actual meaning of this word from the Greek and what it means. And uh, um, and this actually means the uh, Messiah. I think, I don't know why here it's not written, but if you just over here, it should be written. So uh, literally it means anointed. So the anointed one. And this was a title that in the Old Testament, from the prophecies, it was given to the one who would free Israel and eventually the entire world. Uh, it was given this uh, title, the Messiah, that literally means the anointed one. And the Greek transliteration of this word, you know, anointed, is Christ. And that's why they have uh, Paul is right away referring to Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, the Messiah that was you know, uh, talked in the prophecies. And so it's a very important point that Paul's made right away, right? This Jesus that I'm talking about, this person that lived, is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the one that was um, prophesied. And that's why right from the beginning, also in verse 2, you can see that the the gospel of God, you know, uh, he promised before and through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So again, this is another theological point that Paul makes that the prophecies in the Old Testament are regarding this Jesus that he's talking about. So um, concerning his son. So that's why you can see here, like Paul is making just from these first two verses, three verses, he's making a very important theological part. No, I'm, a, I'm being called as an apostle, right? Set apart uh, for the gospel of God, you know? Uh, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, so the Messiah, the anointed one, who was prophesied in the Old Testament. And uh, and then another very important theological point that Paul makes here is the fact that Jesus was both man and God. So he says here, who was born, so concerning his son, who was born of the seed of David, so the descendant of the lineage of David, according to the flesh. So it means according to, you know, the uh, the, the man lineage. And then, but was also son of God. So both man and God. So Jesus, you know, the Messiah was both man and God. So another very important uh, theological point, you know, the dual, dual nature of Jesus being both a man and uh, God. And here I've also listed in my notes the fact that Paul here uses these three words. Um, son of God with power, according to the spirit, by the resurrection of the dead. And um, and you can see again the importance of the uh, resurrection, right? It's a key point in Christianity and in Christian theology. The fact that Jesus not only lived and died for our sins, but also he resurrected. And uh, um, and again here Paul is uh, talking about his calling, and not only his calling, because see that he's this word is plural. So we, we as apostles, right? He identifies as an apostle. So that's why he says he, we. So himself and all the other disciples of Jesus and all the other apostles, we have received this uh, calling, right? To bring the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. Now, Gentiles is a word that means pretty much every uh, person that is not Jew, all right? So that's the meaning of this uh, of this word, Gentile. So um, it's not... Uh, like everyone, literally, any nation, any tribe, any people that uh, um, wasn't Jew was called a Gentile, all right? And so you can see here the calling of Paul is to bring the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. So his main mission was to preach the gospel to um, uh, us, right? To people that weren't Jews. Uh, and then here, uh, like in this part, right? He's just expressing his desire to come to the church, to meet with them, to be encouraged one another, um, to, um, 
uh, just to be with them, right? So, uh, yeah, he, like, he doesn't make any kind of theological point here uh, other than just expressing his, the fact that he feels like he's under obligation, which if you go to the, to the Greek one, it's, uh, he says adapter. So, like, he feels like he's in debt, right? He's calling, uh, he feels like he's in debt to everybody, right? To preach the gospel uh, and to everybody, right? You can see here he's using the word Greeks, so all the Atlantic people and all the non-Greeks, right? So this is actually um, the, if you go to the Greek one, I think he says like barbarians. So which once again is a word referring to, um, to all the, to all the non-Greek people. So to the non, uh, maybe cultured people, but to everybody, right? So he's like, his calling is for everybody. Uh, and then again, we have a lot of uh, very interesting points here from verse 16 to 18, where he says, you know, he's proclaimed what the gospel is. No, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And again, remember that the gospel here, the gospel of God was concerning his son, you know, according to the scriptures uh, that was prophesied. Uh, so he's saying this gospel right here that I'm preaching is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This is a pretty famous verse. Um, so you can see that the gospel is the power of God uh, for salvation, right? And uh, and then he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And this, uh, considering the fact that Jesus came as Jew, you know, Jesus was Jewish and he came for his own people because remember that the Jews are God's chosen people, the people that God chose from the Old Testament to be his own people, uh, to which he makes, I made all the promises, um, but Jesus didn't come only for the Jews, but he came for everybody, right? For all the world. So that's why he says Jew first and also to the Greek. There is a verse, I don't remember where, when Jesus says that he, he was gathering sheep not just from his barn, but from other parts. So he, you know, he, here Jesus is talking about every other nation and tribe. Um, and again, he says for in it, so for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So in this, um, in the gospel, right? So in this, in his son that became a man. So both this figure, you know, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, becoming, being both man and God. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed, you know? Uh, and then here, Paul is quoting a verse from Habakkuk 2, 4, where he says that the righteous will live by faith. So um, again, uh, this concept of faith that the Bible offers is not the concept that you might heard many times, right? The concept of blind faith or the concept of uh, believing without any evidence, right? This faith here is being revealed through Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's not like a blind faith. It's faith in a person, in events that truly happened. Um, and uh, But then we need faith, right? Because we need to then trust in Jesus. We need to rely in him. We need to follow him. And that requires faith because uh, uh, we might face troubles. We might face difficulties, problems. and um, But you, we still need to know God is calling us to still have faith in him, that he has everything under control, and that we can trust in him, that his promises are still there. Uh, and that you know the most important promise is his promise of eternal life, of being eternally united with him, of having his life in us so it doesn't matter even if we end up dying right as apostle paul as all the most of the other disciples did you know and the other christians they were persecuted and they were killed because of their faith um and uh, but you know relying and still following jesus even to that point because you realize that you know his promise of eternal life just is greater than anything else um and then the second part of the chapter uh, there is this first part where it's a kind of apologetical one, where Paul is clearly saying that, um, like, we we as humans, we have no excuse to say God doesn't exist because his eternal power and divine nature are clearly perceived uh, since the creation of the world uh, because they cannot be understood by what has been made. So creation, the universe itself, is evidence for God's um existence and this is kind of apologetics right uh, so we are 
with an excuse, right? And here Paul is talking about the fact that uh, those people, right, who suppress the truth in a righteousness and, you know, a godliness. And uh, so denying God, so suppressing the truth of God for something else. And then here he says that um, because they, they, even though they knew God, so they knew the, uh, the nature of God and the universe, right, they did not honor him. But they try to uh, reason, right? They try to uh, make up points as to uh, answer and probably um, try to explain why the universe and the nature might exist without the need of a God, right? And that's why their reasoning became futile or futile. Uh, and their senseless hearts were darkened. You know, God is seen as... Uh, like Jesus himself proclaimed to be the light of the world, right? So uh, everything that gets away from the source of light becomes darkened. And again, here, they're claiming to be wise. They became fools. You know, all these people, even nowadays, all these philosophers that they try to, they come up with these very interesting ideas like aliens or, uh, I don't know, like uh, physics himself, science itself that can create itself, right? All these very interesting and sometimes uh, weird, you know, ways to try to explain something that is very easily explainable with God. Um, and they exchange, and this is something referring to idolatry, where uh, they exchange the glory of a God that cannot be represented by anything for what? For an image. For an image in the form of mankind, of animals. So uh, this is referring to all those religions or um uh, anything, right? Even because then Paul says that uh, afterwards they worship and uh, serve the creature rather than the creator. And even man is a creature, you know? And many philosophies, they put man at the center, right? As the most important part. You, what you, your own happiness, your own uh, pleasures, your own desires. And so you, you are God. You are the God of your life. So you can decide whatever you want. And that's exactly the same act of idolatry because you're putting yourself as God and you're putting yourself as if you were God. And so, uh, yeah, this is just a condemnation of idolatry. And then here is very interesting that says that, you know, therefore God gave them up to the value impurity. And also in verse 26, it says, for God gave them over to. And, uh, and again, in verse 28, it says, God gave, gave them up to. So you can see that God doesn't force everybody to believe in him you know it's as i said before like is everything is clearly perceived of his nature you no know, is clearly perceived but the fact that you deny god and you try to come up with some um other options or solutions to try to explain reality right it looks like god says okay you want to believe that okay go on like i'm gonna give you up to your own futile thinking right to your own reasonings to your own lusts into your own desires, okay, go on. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop you from doing whatever you want, right? And, how, and here I've, I placed uh, the fact that, yeah, God leaves us the choice to believe whatever we want to believe, but there are consequences. And here the, the apostle is very clear about the, what are the, the consequences of, uh, of this. And, you know, the bodies will be dishonored, um, and, uh, and here in verse 26 to 28, especially, he's talking about any sexual uh, immorality. So, for example, anything contrary to nature, right? So he's talking about homosexuality and any kind of depraved or distortion of what the, um, the sex as God created it is and represents. And, uh, and receiving during their own persons the due penalty. So receiving their own bodies the... Um, the consequences of their own actions. And uh, and here in verse 28 to 32, um, Paul just lists all the things that are not proper to God. So all the things that are opposite to God, that God doesn't like, that are going to bring you against, that God really doesn't like, right? And uh, here you can see, like, it's just a list. Our righteousness, weakness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, Deceit is um, divisions, malice, gossiping, slanderers, 
haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding. So it looks like they understand, but they do not have real understanding. Untrustworthy, unfeeling, unmerciful. So uh, a lot of uh, um, categories, right, of people that are things that are not proper to God. And, uh, and then he says that all these things, this is very important, the, all these things, so those who practice such things are worthy of death. So the main consequence, because we're talking here about, about uh, unbelief, about um, not, uh, f- like, uh, not um, realizing right, that God is the one that is behind all nature, right? And, um, and therefore exchanging you know, the glory of God for something else. You can see that all these things are worthy of death. So the consequence, the worst, and actually the ultimate consequence of these things that are not proper to God, that God condemns, that are against him, are actually is actually death. So that's the ultimate consequence. And here we're not talking about just death, uh, physical death, but is a spiritual death, is a death, is a, a death forever. So um, it's um, yeah, it's just uh, the this first chapter, I think, you know, just summarizing the most uh, important points of the of the things that just s- struck me, right? Um, if you guys have any other things to discuss with, I will be more than happy to answer and to try to go to more details. But you can see that like the word of God is so deep, right? It's so uh, well, like we could spend hours just trying to explain just a few verses because it's so deep. We can connect also to other verses as well. We can connect different things. I'm just trying to go through this, uh, uh, you know, ch- chapter by chapter, trying to analyze each each one on, on its own, you know, um, and, um, and yeah, so I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. God bless you and see ya. Bye-bye.